When we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable, that every human soul is in fact one human soul. It is the soul of the universe itself, and as long as you are doing the will of the universe, then it is impossible to do anything wrong. Anytime you hear Burroughs, you know the cameras are coming on quick. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. Um, hi, I'm Keats. And of course, I am. we are gathered here today in celebration of a man who needs little introduction if you follow Pragmagic or We the Hollowed. Uh, an incredible creator, writer, uh, illustrator, publisher, I would even say. I would love to talk more about independent publishing today. But Mr. Eric J. Millar. Uh, hey. Hello. Should I say shalom, shalom? Yeah. I'll, I'll take your yeah. line. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> shalom, motel. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's so funny. So Eric and I, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, are, are business partners too, I would, I guess yeah. I could say. So we do talk every day. We're more like artistic partners. Yeah. But we, we talk every day, but because of our schedules, we rarely hear each other's voices. So yeah. this is a, a rarity. So... I'm excited to catch yeah. up. Me too. Me too. <laughs> You're usually working. I'm usually sitting at home waiting for my kid to get off of school. Right. And speaking of your kid, uh, so Eric's in their new house, which is really exciting. And mm -hmm. uh, Eric's in his son's room, which I was just marveling at the beautiful blue <laughs> color. It's see, very Eric, that color yeah. too. I see, see, I, I should have gone into my bedroom because it's the We the Hollowed purple. Mm. <laughs> That's cool. So every room has its own kind of distinct. So far, so far. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the living room is going to be green soon. So awesome. Nah, yeah. But... I love that. Uh, just having that intentional kind of atmosphere in every room. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, it's kind of one of the uh, the problems with rentals. They all feel like asylums because they're all white. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. You try to just clutter it up, yeah. but that white still comes out. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so, yes, hello, everybody in chat. Uh, John aside, good to see you. Hello, Mario. Philip, good to see you. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm really excited to talk about Wombat. And Mario asks, is a Wombat the one from Rocco's Modern Life? <laughs> I, I think he's a Wombat. I think he is a Wombat. I know. He's a, uh, it's an, yeah, it's, a, it's another marsupial, but it's not a kangaroo. It's, uh, I'll think about it. Is it a Wombat? I think well, he's a wombat. I'm going to obsess over this, so <laughs> we better move on. Um, hello, Lynn. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, so, yes, Wombat is actually the title of Eric's brand new book uh, that he self-published, which you can find on Lulu. I'm going to go ahead and put the address in the chat. And, uh, yeah, Eric has a copy, I think the test copy, which you can kind of show us. I got the test copy with the old title. Let's see if we can do that. So, yeah. So, explain the title of Wombat, actually. All right. So, uh, about a month and a half ago, I went to Minnesota and visited my mother and my dad. Like, I, I visited family. And my mom had this little book of old text message acronyms from 2001. And I just started flipping through it, and I found Wombat stands for waste of money brains and time nice and which I, is I basically, like, that's perfect it's perfect yeah which is basically like every artistic venture right exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> i was thinking about that today i think you and i have found a space where we're like actually rather enjoying the freedom of not having um it be kind of you know all-encompassing like financially mm -hmm. and you know, and otherwise, there is a certain freedom in that, that we're just kind of, you know, we make things when we feel like it. Yep. It's 
been our ability to continue to create a bunch is because we're not weighed down by like scheduling or yeah you know, any kind of mature process uh when oh it comes yeah to promotion yeah <laughs> yeah exactly exactly i i lose interest the more work i have to put into everything outside of the art like yeah when, when i do press when i do anything like that i try to sell it i i hate it i hate it i can't stand being a salesman yeah like, I did. I didn't start making art to be a salesman. I started art to be an artist and make stuff because I like making stuff. So sales yeah. is hard. Sales is hard for me. <laughs> yeah, and you know, there's you know, there's something to be said about. I think that you know, I often find that bittersweet moment. It's usually like, it can be seconds. It can be hours after you release something, mm -hmm. where you you do feel like a release and something is done. You put it to bed. And then you're obsessive about the next thing. Oh but yeah. To go through the like, even it's it's especially in music, like to go through the press train. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when Cactus Crown came out, I told myself I was actually going to, you know, get it reviewed and send it to places. And it was almost a year of that just existing in that while I was doing other shit. Yeah. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 i'm i've i think disruption generator is the only thing i ever did a real push on mm -hmm. and yeah by the by the end of like a year year and a half of doing that i i was just like no no more no more yeah. I'm, I'm tapping out well in disruption generator too it's funny because it's often that ironic thing where almost like the less intentful um, almost like a, a sort of you were super intentful about it, but almost the schema of it wasn't as like rigorous. Mm -hmm. I guess it was because you did have to illustrate like weekly, right? Yeah. On. But I mean, yeah. like you used a random word generator and then illustrated the word. And you did that for 120 illustrations. So, yeah, yeah. saying it out loud. That is very <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty intense, pretty intense. And then spending like the next six, next six or eight months, like talking about it. Yeah. I just meant like, you know, when it comes to books and which we'll talk about right mm -hmm. now, which, you know, you've written narratively and you've written, you know, uh, more kind of, uh, you know, just word focused and stuff. Mm -hmm. There is something about it never feeling finished and yeah. having to basically it's like having a stillborn child almost. And then you're mm -hmm. having to parade it around <laughs> because yeah. the actual, you know, successfully birth thing just didn't come yet you know mm -hmm. not that saying your any of your work is doing that i just mean like the uh <laughs> you know that kind of process of it's not finished and i'm having to kind of promote yeah. it so yeah. disruption generator felt like it in and of itself was an entire concept like it didn't yeah have a lot of uh you know rigmarole in your brain about it it was like a simple schema that oh you yeah kept up with. yeah yeah i just like churned it out essentially like it, it was very intentful it was I, I i put all my focus on it but i i was churning like by the 120th it was just it just became my routine you know what's really cool is so i've been doing disruption mondays uh for patreon mm -hmm. i did one that was public but basically it's using your disruption generator and then using uh the alw cipher Mm -hmm. And what it's done too, in a weird way, is it's made me really marvel at your posts for the disruption generator because yeah. you illustrated these things and then you made an article um, for each one. And what we've been doing is like going to our site, which Eric and I cite as We the Hollowed. Um, you know, we'll look up Deer, which is one of your disruption mm -hmm. generators, and there's a whole easy compendium to find them and everything you need no. but imagine 120 and those of you uh watching that don't know the background or like the back end of what it takes to kind of publish an article it's not that easy it's not like a facebook post there's a lot no. of design and uh seo and you know rather boring things that go into mm. it but eric did this for 120 illustrations and it, that's a feat in and of itself it's something that I've been marveling at lately because that alone is intense. And then you collect yeah. them into a book and you self publish the book and then it takes on a life of its own. People mm -hmm. start using it divinatorily. Like how, how have you felt about 
its recent legacy because i guess it's coming up on oh man almost years? five years five years yeah next year will be five years yeah and i don't know it's crazy like i haven't seen that many people talking about it anymore but i'm kind of like in a way i'm kind of glad because it feels like it had its big burn moment and then now it's this obscure thing that people can just discover yeah and you can still purchase it too on yeah what i love about yours for some reason i don't know if you chose to do this but you can sh uh, get short links to share for your books and i haven't found that for other ones oh yeah so that's in the chat too portable disruption generator right. um we'll come back to this but yeah again so what i love is wombat comes from acronyms used in text which sound totally made up like who spoke yeah. like that you know in text oh, yeah <laughs> no nobody did nobody did like yeah. the original title that is the end of the the end of the world as we know it nobody ever used that acronym ever <laughs> never you no tio twaki was never used by anyone <laughs> yeah never. and they were I like that one because it reminds me of like an Aztec kind of. Word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Wombat, which I love, waste of brains, money and time. Mm -hmm. um, is this like, I mean, I know I get your humor, but uh, yes, is this I mean, it, it's kind of uh, an overall saying of the, the work itself, or is it more of just kind of a joshing? Kind it's kind of, of a joshing. Yeah, it's kind of a joshing because. Uh... I know the the name kind of spins out of a a resentment towards AI art, <laughs> yeah, and the fact that people have been marveling over stuff that's just generated by a computer and a string of words. Like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm sure people are like coming up with really intricate ways of like telling a machine to do something, but you can go to a KFC and tell a machine an intricate drink order does that mean that that's a piece of art <laughs> that it's a yeah chef basically yeah um, it's it's I, not how I, it works yeah i don't know you know that's yeah that's that's interesting i think now since the big hullabaloo i think the uh recent findings that uh ai art, AI art can't be copywritten mm -hmm. has burned it for a lot of oh yeah people because oh yeah yeah <laughs> I think they thought like, oh shit, I can become an artist and maybe actually make money yeah. off of this. And now you, you can't make money yeah. off of it unless you're selling it to rubes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Just well, like uh, NFTs. What's, so the book itself, um, I know we've, we've talked about it a lot, but uh, it's kind of a compendium of sorts. So it is. It's, it's basically like your, another modern art book, right? It is. It is. I'll uh, bring up the contents. I'll get the hang of this camera here soon. <laughs> so it's uh, six different projects that none of them felt like they could live on their own. Because I used to, I would finish a project and just make a book every mm -hmm. time. And that made it really impossible to make short projects. Like I couldn't do like a 16 page thing. I couldn't do a 30 page thing because I couldn't wrap it around a book. And like, I don't, I don't like selling books for a lot of money because I, I don't want to feel like I'm ripping people off. Yeah. I mean, I think the six books in one is a hell of a deal as it is, you know? Well, and for 20 bucks, it's yeah. like, that's incredible. It's pretty thick. It's uh, 215 pages. Because I have to say, <clears throat> one of the works in there, especially uh, Assemblage of Disparate Parts, is I think one of my all-time favorites of yours. I think it's like a like a seminal work of yours. So that yeah. alone should be worth. <laughs> oh yeah, I just I took all of the collages I did for that book and mm -hmm. gave them some room to breathe because like that's a hell oh, of yeah. a lot bigger than it was in the original book. Okay, like, yeah, so it doesn't a have hell of the a lot tech. bigger doesn't have yeah. the text it's just okay. the art awesome that's really cool it's like this stuff did not have room to breathe before and it's on like fancy slick paper heavier mm -hmm. like a, a, a better print quality so like the details really shine through like they didn't before yeah those it's so beautiful 
uh you had sent me like an actual one that you had made and just to see mm -hmm. what that process looked like was jarring because it's like really intricate uh of a collage. Yeah. yeah yeah a lot of uh a lot of double-sided tape yeah <laughs> I don't like using glue because the pieces were too small. So I had to use uh, double sided tape. I was using like leftover double sided tape we had from weatherizing our windows nice. a couple years ago. I love it. There's a very like blue collar feel to that. Mm -hmm. you know? But uh, what I was going to say uh, about, you know, Wombat too, there was something like, uh, a, yeah, with Disruption Generator, you had done a short run release of the big hardbacks and those were gorgeous like amazing mm -hmm. beautiful works i know that they were very costly yes to do um and so it's, it's something like that in the future do, do you have in mind something like that would need to be like crowdfunded or um it's it either be crowdfunded and printed myself mm -hmm. or like the problem with doing hardcovers with print on demand is hardcovers cost a lot of money with print on demand. Like yeah. the disruption generator I did, the the printing price was twenty dollars a book. And I was selling it for thirty five. So I could try to get it on some store shelves and stuff that never happened because mm -hmm. One of the things that people don't understand, I don't think, about how wholesaling books works is most stores will pay you for half of the cover price. So you have to double the price if you want to make money on it. I see. Yeah. So but like, like uh, when you buy on the barcodes at bookstores, like I just recently bought a book in a local occult shop and I was surprised that they charged me the price that was on the barcode. Yeah. And not like some additive thing, but I guess it makes sense if they're already just making half of that. Yeah. yeah. They're buying, they're buying the book for half the price that's on the cover Mm -hmm. And then that other half goes between production costs, paying the editors, the authors, all of that stuff. If you self-publish, it just goes right to the person that made the book. But like for me, I, I'm my own editor and designer and all of that stuff. So any, any money that comes from a sale from my books goes right to me. Yeah. And that's really nice and beneficial. I do think there's yeah. something there. Yeah, maybe about crowdfunding a bulk so that you could disperse them in yeah. brick and mortar, you know? Yeah. I think that's that would be great. I mean, your books would be awesome in like the local comics shops and Fantagraphics, oh, yeah. I'm sure would absolutely carry some of this stuff, you know? Yeah, it would, it would be nice. It would be nice. But but isn't that always the thing, right? It's that upfront yeah. cost. I mean, it, it really, really is like getting yeah. any, any kind of distributor. I would have to buy a bunch and I'd have to change the prices. Cause like right now this is priced almost like, I almost don't make anything off of it. I make, right. I make a small profit. It's a $20 book for like 200 pages of glossy, glossy paper and all of that stuff. But like, I don't make a whole lot off of it because I want people to, be able to buy it <laughs> right and a lot of the reason too is you know using something like on print demand or on demand printing is mm -hmm. yeah it goes direct to whoever wants yeah. it not a huge middleman no uh, you know so i get that i get the the modernity of it is really yeah. convenient for both publisher and yeah you know, customer. Well, it's like it's like Bandcamp, you know you yeah put, put put a release on Bandcamp so people can buy it basically yeah. directly from you and have one middleman yeah i definitely want to get back into print media um for sure i mean you've been a big uh light about that just you know having a bookshelf of mine you know <laughs> full of your books of it's just awesome like Derek yeah. hunter's good at that too uh you know haunt manual is going to be printed but mm -hmm. Um, I always want to pick your brain about that because like what, you know, where, where do we go next? Is it really just kind of, uh, we are keeping on the kind of self printing through these suppliers. Is there mm -hmm. any kind of service or way to get into more of like a, like a local or a brick and I guess that's it. Right. Yeah. Cause brick and mortar, you would have to buy a bulk mm -hmm. and they would have to sell them. 
or like consignment, right? Like it would be yeah. if I sold records at Amoeba or something. Yeah, and I used yeah. to do I used to do consignment at uh, Floating World here in Portland. Yeah, I love Floating World. Yeah, it's it's basically like the best comic book store you could ever go into, and I had some of my books on their on the shelf there, but they started refusing some of the more text heavy ones because they were like, "These aren't comics. We're not gonna we're not gonna carry these." Right. Like most of their consignment stuff are zines and mini comics and like mm -hmm. little things. Like I was coming in with like full size graphic novels and being like, "Hey, can you sell this?" And they're like, N -n "No." <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, we uh, yeah, we we sold we the hollowed zines at Floating World way back yep. when yep. that first one. But uh, I was gonna say, I do think there's something. You know, I do want to bridge it back. I there's something in my head, and. It's like an itch and it's almost like the salons we used to do, mm -hmm. but there is kind of a traveling, you know, the way a lot of artists, especially in the music sphere and even in book writing, a lot of like readings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a live and in-person kind of event oriented way and like a yeah. traveling book fair salon type thing would just be. Oh, awesome. that would be awesome. Yeah. That would be awesome. And I, I think there would be, a desire for that mm -hmm. it would just be i think there would be a lot of upfront costs that the average independent artist wouldn't be able to carry these days yeah you know we were talking recently too about how funny it is that we're watching you know very politically charged people make millions of dollars off of like independent oh, comics yeah. from crowdfunding yeah and the cr and the comics are shit. <laughs> like, oh, the yeah, 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 but those, yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. making money off of their politics. They're not making money off of their off of what they're making. They're making it off of what they're saying. Yeah, and I think you know. But with that said, as that example, it's like there's you know there's got to be a way. I think crowd, there is something to crowdfunding. I've always been afraid of it. I think yeah. my ego would you know whatever is left of my ego would die a very very unpleasant death if i couldn't raise a small amount of money to print something you know what i mean yeah so I've, I've kept away from it but i'm sure that's who knows it's ridiculous yeah i've kept away from it because i've heard it turns into a full-time job <laughs> yeah like doing a crowdfunding campaign becomes a full-time job where you're constantly fielding questions you're constantly dealing with like feedback you're dealing with trying to push it every single day like hour after hour pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and it's just like this endless press rush before the thing even comes out and people can actually discuss the thing you're making yeah it's almost like i guess that's where a lot of the criticism falls flat too about those billion dollar crowdfunding comics is people already made up their minds when they you know yeah. paid and supported it's like buying shares or stock yeah something yeah. that's not even out yet and you don't know how it's going to read and if you feel like you partly own this thing like you don't want to give it fair criticism yeah know? yeah and i mean i have been burned a couple times doing kickstarters where the stuff like just never showed up and it felt like it felt like i wasted my money yeah they, it just never showed up i hear that a lot too is that like a common you know I think it all is depends. That a common grift i don't i don't know i don't know because sometimes it's for legitimate reasons. Sometimes it's for like bullshit reasons. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like I, there's a documentary that I, I crowdfunded, like I gave money to that. I gave it to him seven years ago. Wow. Still, still not out. <laughs> right. And I guess you don't have it like for the, however much money you gave, it's not really worth any like legal yeah. recourse or, you know. Oh yeah. No, no. I yeah. think I gave him like, 50 bucks so i can get some extra stuff yeah speaking of self-publishing uh scavenge rituals is here what's hey. up man? we have both worked with scavenge rituals nope. which is a great uh yeah, yeah. new zine self-published very cool nope um, I have illustrations in both issues yes you do and i've got uh the seven inch in the first one which mm -hmm. was like yeah that was a uh, bucket list stuff for sure i'll oh, put yeah. scavenge rituals link in the chat please check it out it's beautiful stuff very cool um homemade but at the same time high quality awesome yeah stuff. i was it was it was so close to being a bucket list thing for me on making a record cover 
but oh i mean yeah we'll still do it that. was just a, it was so, just some printer stuff that wasn't quite working right but i oh, still really? got to have a yeah i couldn't he he couldn't get the uh cd sleeves oh that's to, right to get printed on and it's i'm still happy to have that illustration in the actual zine but man so close to being a record cover that really should have been a seven inch <laughs> cover too um it still will be like oh yeah we'll still use it for something oh, i've got yeah. The Rebel Raw stuff. I'm actually going to, uh, in the studio album, I'm breaking up the songs with uh, excerpts of the um, audio mancy. Kind mm -hmm. of weaves it all together. And so, yeah, that's part of that. So that'll have to be part of there. There you go. Uh, you are both so inspirational in your approach to art, and I wish you only the best for your numerous efforts. Thank you very much, sir. Thank and you. You have been amazing to us. We appreciate you. No. Um, always, always happy to contribute. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, that felt good. That's like I think stuff where we are engineered for is. Oh, yeah. Someone's making a super artistic DIY thing, and I want to be any part of that anyone needs. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I honestly just like making shit. Yeah. Exactly. Like any anything that I can do that might challenge what I what I do. I, I I revel in the chance to do it. Like, I love it. I love it. And like doing doing the uh, illustration for that first issue for your album, mm -hmm. like that, I took that as a challenge. I was like, well, how can I actually make something that would be a good piece of album art? I mean, the fact that you whip that out too, like, <laughs> your, um, like your rhythm on when we work with haunt manual stuff and I'm like, hey, this is the next chapter. This is what it's uh, going to be about. You know, uh, if you have any ideas, I could use some art I haven't used before. In like 20 minutes, Eric will send me basically the what? entire aesthetic. Yeah, that's for an well, upcoming one. Yeah, sneak peek there. Yeah, yeah I'll give a full <laughs> screen of that. And you can see the actual textures. And you're using uh, old book covers too. Which yeah, is it's a, it's an old book cover. Like yeah. you're, that's that's been the. Yeah, I have another one yeah there that's the go. that's the one that's out this week or next week sneak peek yeah. it's all all analog mm -hmm. on oh put covers. up the uh, the gematria one again because what's really cool if you get closer on the numbers they are stickers right yeah, yeah. they are yeah. they are stickers i stole from a job over a decade ago yeah <laughs> I, love it. I, just, I just had it squirreled away somewhere. But yeah, that is uh that's the art for this next haunt manual. And real quick, uh the Ren Collier and uh ALW Cypher Pragmagic podcast. I had to re-edit from scratch after oh. hours of work. Um oh, man. you know, part of me is like, hey Mercury Retrograde, what are you gonna do? And another part of me is like, fuck that you know <laughs> um those are the two warring sides of me all the time but uh i think yeah i'm, I'm glad i did uh i worked for it i worked on it for hours yesterday and i'm like no this is better so i think it's those and i'm sure you go through those two oh, where yeah. something just erases hard work and art and you're like i'm sure you've had to learn to just let it go or say like oh it wasn't yeah. supposed to be yeah you yeah. roll with it you yeah. roll with it like you can't help it. Like I've, I've lost entire projects and it's why I like obsessively back up everything now. Like all of my art has the original file plus backups in two different locations, just in case I have a hard drive crash. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and it's funny. Some folks I was talking to you about that, you know, you, you always get the platitudes of like, you know, this is a lesson about, you know, maybe letting things go or blah, blah, blah. And, I'm like, you've obviously never had multiple backpacks full of handwritten, yeah, you know, chapters of books and notes and drawings and shit stolen from you. Like, yeah. there is an ache to that that <laughs> cannot oh, be replaced. Yeah, you know? yeah. I had uh, I had an entire portfolio of paintings get moldy in my old house, the place that we just moved out of. Yeah. Didn't find it until we moved, and I had to get rid of like 20 paintings because they were covered in mold 
and did they it look was cool? heartbreaking yeah oh, no it looked disgusting no. yeah it, <laughs> it just it looked and smelled disgusting and i had to get it out of the house yeah my immediate thought is like oh what'd it look like though you know just gross uh, it's just probably gross. yeah cancerous <laughs> but uh if it looked cool no um it reminds me of the uh uh i remember i went to moma in los angeles when i was like in high school mm -hmm. and because there was an andy warhol exhibit um and of course you know that was like that was that was the like the velvets and all that shit were mm -hmm. huge was, for me yeah uh, when i was a kid but uh going there and i remember standing in front of this copper painting that had all of these green boils and like you know chemical pustules on mm -hmm. it and i'm looking at it i'm wondering what it is and i hear a tour guide explain it and they said that andy warhol painted this canvas with copper paint then stuck it in the corner of his factory and that and he locked his bathroom and he said anyone who needs to use the restroom go onto this canvas <laughs> on the copper canvas <laughs> and i caught myself i'm in this really high-end <laughs> museum and i'm staring at this painting going that's Lou Reed's piss on this. <laughs> and it's it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's literal piss art, you know. Oh man, that reminds me of Piss Christ. Piss Christ, that sounds familiar. It's a it was a little jar of piss with a crucifix inside of it. I can't remember who the artist was. <laughs> But it went it went for a lot of money and it was just literally a jar of piss with a crucifix in it. Oh, that's great. I gotta look that up. Piss Christ. That's funny. That yeah. reminds me of uh was it Ghost World, the uh mm. tampon and the teacup. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Oh, oh, art. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you did um we have wombat there's an article and stuff people mm -hmm. can find more about it on we the hollowed no. but uh other than i know you've recently x'd out of twitter but um <laughs> that's been a while that has yeah, been a that's, while now it's been a while um are there any other kind of uh i guess like i yeah it's just more like promotional aspects you think people could you know kind of reach out Me? to you for yeah or well know, i mean i I'm still on Instagram. Yeah. I mean, because <laughs> that's, I mean, honestly, that's why I use Instagram or it's just a post yeah. about stuff that we're making, you know? Yeah. Well, and it used to be like the, the, the ideal platform for sharing art because yeah. it was very, very just image based. And it's only in the last couple of years that it's become about videos. I don't know. Like my recommendations went from being a bunch of things about art and cool artists to women Oops. jiggling their boobs at a camera. So <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the TikTokification. Yeah, All right. there's a uh, scavenge rituals again, but here is uh, Eric's Instagram for those of you that use it and want to follow. Uh, it's great. He posts. He posts art and. That's what you that's, want. That's, yeah, that's all I post. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I only ask because, you know, to go back to the AI thing, I don't know if you want to dig into that a little more, but I know it could be like incendiary. Mm. Um, you mean the article I wrote? <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> there's the article, but it's also like, I think that was, you know, kind of a background to what wombat you said was becoming yeah yeah wombat um, started from that and then the next book came from that that's right where, and those yeah. yeah that's a good one yeah the next book is essentially an autobiography like i yeah. decided i was just gonna because i came to an idea that art is a memory machine mm -hmm. that art made by an artist it's 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 created and manifested from millions of little pieces that you pick up as you go and right. that what goes on it goes into your art no matter what it's pieces of you going into that and that is yeah. the thing that is essentially removed through ai art and generative art and stuff like that using chat gpt using anything that artificially creates the stuff is it removes the the the, the memory yeah, machine filter. part of yeah. it yeah yeah, is this there's there's no humanity to it because 
that's what art is. Art is humanity. It is it is your memories. It is your person, no matter what you're making. Even if it's not expressly there, the pieces of it are. Yeah. I guess, I mean, that's, yeah, very similar to Haunt Manual. Because um, mm -hmm. that's a very, you know, hauntology of the self, you know, through the discography of yeah. self. Yeah. Or like through even just, you know, spiritual growth and practice and how it pertains to art over the years or how it's created yeah. and i was thinking about that the other day like there's no part of haunt manual i could use ai for yeah you know like there's yeah. no element of it i guess maybe i guess yeah what what we if we define ai i mean i think what everybody if we were to define it i think it's it's obvious what we mean by you know the kind of current prompt based uh yeah. generative not yeah. like uh you know mastering tools for music or whatever but like, yeah 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 i mean if you're just using ai to touch up something you've already made i feel that that's completely legit legitimate like putting filters on things and stuff like that that's that's legit but the moment you're just like typing in a string of words and or giving like an outline of what you want a machine to make for you you're making a hot dog you're not I, yeah <laughs> i saw that there was a title for those folks mm. and like prompt conductor or something and i was like it's gone it's gone full bore like it's jumped the oh. shark like yeah oh. if you're titling yourself or priding yourself on like oh. your prompt you know well i know some people like sell prompts like they sell their services as being expert prompters and that's yeah. that's bananas i mean if someone will pay for it <laughs> i guess i can yeah. see like I can see being good at it, like knowing, I think it also, you know, is a, there's an artistic thing about it too, about, you know, being succinct or erudite with language or being mm -hmm. very direct about elements, you know, yeah. you can't just say 1940s photograph. You'll have to say like, you know, uh, uh, height of world war two circa, you know, Prague yeah. in blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know photograph so like giving it more of those directives is uh kind of an art but i do find it funny that people would pay for that and what would they use it for like i don't know i yeah. don't know it's just it's to like make the, cool stuff just to look at you know yeah it's like the people that make like the what if wes anderson made star wars videos where it's mm -hmm. just these series of pictures that they ran through like mid journey where they they have like a certain style to it, but it's still not quite right. It's just, yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah, I've seen those, or like they'll animate the mouths of the yeah. actors, yeah, yeah. And it, no, it's a gimmick, yeah, it's, it's a it's, gimmick, it's a gimmick. Yeah. You're, you're driving views based on the fame of Star Wars, mm -hmm. Wes Anderson, and you're just trying to ride that train and making fan art with yeah. the machine. When it comes, when it comes to this stuff, I mean. I, you know, I started recording and releasing music when I was 13. And that mm -hmm. was at like the genesis of the digital audio workstation, mm -hmm. you know, and that was also around mp3.com. So that was, you know, I could alone create an entire song, play all the instruments, have as many takes as I wanted, you know, mm -hmm. to get it right, export it, upload it to mp3.com, collect it in a CD and get a CD mm -hmm. mailed to me. Yeah. like i was putting out an album so i see you know and that it made me feel i guess like a record label right yeah. or or some sort of manufacturer so i i get the like the gimmick of having that feeling that you know you are part of this process that seemed far away you know yeah or yeah. unreachable but just like anything you know the gimmick died down like i remember i mean it's all the way back to you know detroit techno or whatever where people were going nutsoid about just you know um samplers and you mm -hmm. know uh with a few little prompts or primitive kind of tweaks you could create an entire song yeah and people were excited about it and then it died down you know and yeah i feel like this is not unlike something yeah, like oh, that yeah this yeah. is definitely it's it's definitely it seems like a pretty short cycle too because i don't see that many people actually talking about the generative art anymore Mm -hmm. it's i really do think it's that copyright the copyright thing. thing yeah people yeah. thought they could own what they were making even though it was made from mm -hmm. the scraps of other people's work yeah 
I mean, it's why sample culture kind of died too, is that instead of like allowing for samples to happen, now artists charge a great deal of money when you want to use a sample of their music. It's That's like uh, kind of an underlying thing with like Mark Fisher's, you know, capitalist realism Mm -hmm. or whatever, or even like his take on hauntology or like the no future. It's all Mm -hmm. just like recycled past stuff. And we've hit a moment where, you know, oh yeah. And Mario, so somebody that Mario and I watch uh, CW Chanter Mm -hmm. often has this saying, no new music. Now, I I think he means it to be a bit more acerbic about that, like indefinite. Um, But I get it in the sense of like, yeah, but that shouldn't dissuade you from doing something through your filter. There might be someone that's similar, but, you know, through your own, even like, and that's the big thing for me with like the individuality of like music um, is the physicality of it too. Or drawing, right? And art. Yeah. Yeah. Like someone can copy your style, but they can't fine tune your exact physical anchors and rhythms and movements and you right, know what I mean? right. they can cover right. the song they can sample the song but yeah, yeah it's interesting it's a it's i've definitely gone down the rabbit hole a bit uh, the thought processes um because i think the ai art really riled me up in the mm-hmm. beginning um and then it just kind of i was like this is just like when f- fucking fruity loops came out and everyone became became a dj right right like it's not taking jobs from me there's still people that want you know the kind of how do i put it i I don't want to say analog but like the more human error human human they want the human art the human art you know it's not it's like that was the difference though with the ai art thing was the Mm -hmm. conversations we were having with people that were saying instead of uh you know, I can't afford comic artists to create my yeah. comic. So now AI art has given me the opportunity to illustrate my comic. And that, you know, I guess I can see that from their point of view, but from like the ma- the macro looking at it, it's like, so essentially you really are taking jobs away from artists. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, we don't need you. We can, I'll just settle for this. And it's never going to be, you know, as good as, you know, you want it to be, you can't fine tune it really that yeah. well, you know? So, well, and I mean, the secret with that too, like using your example, like there are millions of people that want to illustrate comics. And if you can pitch your idea to one of them, they will probably do it for free if you yeah. share the copyright with them. Yeah. Like if you share the trademark, you go, okay, we will be partners in this. We are both investing time and money in this. Mm hmm. I know of someone who makes AI pictures of elderly family members uh, to make pictures of their younger self in various adventures. That's interesting. Spooky. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of people struggle with technology. Um, it's from Philip Blair. Yeah, that's spooky. I mean, that's kind of cool in a like in a hauntological artistic sense of, you know, like lost futures of these relatives. Like you can kind of illustrate what would happen through the eyes of, you know, what's seemingly real photographs but yeah I, I, it also sounds like I, and again i'm not paranoid about anything like that i the idea it seems neat but it there is something yeah. fucking spooky about it you know i can see like the, the the wish fulfillment idea yeah that. it's kind of a it's kind of like a sense of role play mm-hmm. and i understand that i like i kind of understand that for like doing it for yourself like i don't i don't see like the idea of like let's say you were doing that and then selling it as a story about yourself and like selling that as yeah. like i actually did this look at this picture yes and i think that that was the biggest criticism i think we both shared for when that was happening yeah. was you know someone that gets a ai art to illustrate their comic book but they don't outright say it it says illustrated and written by blah 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 yeah you know and you know that that was the big thing is like do a do ai art you know just don't pass it off like you did the ai yeah art, yeah you know? <laughs> i mean it's yeah you can say like you know prompt by you know i don't know yeah and we might i don't know we, we're probably old hats in this just because we've you know we're so much on the other sphere where i think both of us are really diving into even deeper tendrils of diy and human error 
mm -hmm. and like the beauty in like you know just the kind of the rough and tumble of human experience you know transferred from memory and and processes and mistakes and relationships and all of that you know into yeah. stuff and sure that's been done time and you know time immemorial but again that's like the human experience that's like what this yeah. is yeah but also like the the act of prompting something like that means you already have a mental picture of that ah you're you've already imagined yourself in that situation do you really how could an ai photograph yeah create even that. even compare to your imagined idea of what you're seeing hey. Like in a way, it's recontextualizing your imagination. So you're imagining what it shows you instead of what you're imagining for yourself. Right. And in that sense, do you you snuff out your imagination and yeah. accept the one that was created, created for you? Yeah. 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 Like there's a lot of thoughts on that where it's just like, yeah. I just I like people being able to use their imaginations to to make things with their own hands yeah and i think that's where i come by you know my entire yeah. uh, thing has always been the confluence you know yeah. i i use samplers and uh you know yeah. synthesizers and or whatever midi i, I mean, have in the past you. i've gotten to a part where you know if i am sequencing it's my samples that i've recorded that are mine yeah. you know what i mean but it's yeah. me playing it's me playing the drums or it's me playing the guitar or it's from something that I created in the past. It's like a self sample culture. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there's like that aspect of like that confluence of utilizing both and like having fun dancing with it, you know, drum machines yeah. is like dancing with it. Sure. I'm creating the yeah. patterns, but you're limited to what it can do, you know? Right. Right. And, well, and like, playing music like, on top of that, drumming on top of that, you know, that's mm -hmm. that's you're like playing it. with it instead of it playing for you. Yeah. 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 You're you're an organ grinder when you right. when you just like have something else do it for you. You're turning a crank and the music plays. Right. You're the monkey. But like you're the monkey. You're not you're not the you're not the the organ. You're the monkey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like you were going to show something. So I put. You yeah. Like like. like even I sample like this came from a children's book about ants, That's but right. I turned it into something else. Like I, I physically took a marker after it and cut pieces out and like made it a, its own thing. It's sampling, but it's sampling in a completely different way. Yeah. And you also set parameters almost by like, if you think of prompts, right? Like the AI... Yeah you can choose like hey every three words cross mm -hmm. something out or every three lines cross something out i guess what i'm getting to is like in the future i'm sure ai could make those micro decisions of you yeah. know those prompt decisions like that but still it wouldn't be how you would have done it or maybe right. could, you know i mean yeah. i should probably Who talk knows? to my father about this at some point yeah uh, but I, I mean i I've heard one legitimate, like one thing that I feel like I, I wholeheartedly see as a good purpose of generative art. Yeah. And I would say yes. And yes. And both. He does yeah. it all. But comedy, yeah. dark comedy is a big part. It, it does happen. It happens yeah. sometimes. Um, but like with AI, with AI generative art, I have seen somebody who couldn't use their hands anymore in a really useful way someone that can't physically do the thing using generative art to you to make what they can't physically make mm -hmm. i wholeheartedly agree go for it that is yeah. actually kind of miraculous that a person could be able to do that but even to your point it still wouldn't be the image they had in mind no no yeah. and like and I don't draw exactly what comes out of my head either. For sure. Yeah. I think like, that's, that's a life. That's a yeah. life's work is translating like, that. Yeah. Like the stuff that I make isn't exactly right either, but it's what I made and it's what I like, I generated off of what I was imagining. But yeah, now I wish I would have grabbed one of my, uh, let's see. AI is, is a flat and mirror image of our collective memories. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it is a pool. But it's only a pull up to a certain time. Like the thing yeah. that that I find funny about ChatGPT is the cutoff is like 2020 or something. 
yeah like it's pulled all from the internet up until 2020 so like it doesn't exist after that so we're really talking to a ghost we're talking yeah. to regurgitated you know uh falsify or like regurgitated memories in a chasm that's limited in a yeah. way yeah often well, a purity of our own imagination yeah but most people don't rise above that status i would say yeah no yeah. i i would agree i i think it is kind of self-parody in a way mm -hmm. it's but also whole... like when in 2020 what was the cutoff in 2020 was it pre-covid paranoia or post-covid paranoia well it probably was like <laughs> oh yeah the, i think because that was also like the the big misinformation internet yeah scare like, thing, so I wonder like if misinformation just... exploded in 2020. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't think there has been a year with more misinformation than 2020. There you go. We're starting it here, folks. <laughs> Chat GPT, the ghost of 2020. <laughs> I guess, uh, and essentially the ghost, a ghost that's younger than me, which is crazy to think about. When did like, yeah. when did it, when did online go online? You know what I mean? Oh man. Early nineties. I think so. Yeah. Like, I think my, my parents got the internet when I was like 13. Yeah. That sounds about right. Back uh, my stepdad. dial up days. <laughs> yeah. My stepdad, uh, I, I do commend him for this. He taught himself computers. So we were always like in like these crazy, like hacker junk, like stores just full of CD ROMs mm -hmm. and weird things. And he had this room and he was always building and stuff and. So I was always like I, I was around it and I kind of knew it and was kind of natural with it. I think that's yeah. why, uh, you know, digital recording was so easy for me mm. um, because to come from four track cassette tapes and bouncing tracks and, you know, duplicating as just to like, oh, if I screw up, it doesn't ruin the entire song. All right, let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it's interesting to think that that was uh, uh, almost like the specter of a brother yeah you know what i mean or like a sibling that i was growing up alongside of and then it just caps at 2020 it died of covid in 2020. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah the ghost of 2020 yeah. uh yep. this is crazy yeah tons of ai tarot decks i stuff. am not surprised by that at yeah. all <laughs> i'm sure that's a wes anderson tarot deck yeah i'm sure it's a <laughs> wes anderson ae white influenced no. you know art deco tarot deck it's like no yeah it's bet, it's funny I, it's, it feels to me like it's just aesthetics it's like everyone mm -hmm. is it's just an aesthetic culture yeah like i was talking yeah. to my younger brother and he seems to be into this thing too like wasn't about the art so much it's like yeah but it's a cool aesthetic and i was like what do you mean like <laughs> you know and like the aesthetic they were talking about was so literal um Ugh. I don't want to like, I'm not going to, you know. Yeah, no, example, no, I get it. But I, like, get it. I just remember the aesthetic was so literal. And I was like, you know, to me, that's kind of, that's, I don't know. There's some like death of the aesthetic then, you know what I mean? Once it becomes yeah. uh, a literal ism or like a uniform of some sort, it's just like, well, yeah. we're done with that now, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. it's, well, it's when, do we re now. when do we rebel against this? Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> every every artistic movement has had some point of rebellion. When do we yeah. rebel against this like vapid aesthetic culture and move towards something with content again? It's uh it's Instagram filter culture. It like it is, really it is. is, you know. Like I am I am I am ready for the death of social media. And yeah. I think it'll be so good for the human psyche when social media dies. I've <laughs> resigned to the fact that it's gonna just have to be something I'm gonna have to learn, you know, to work I with. Yeah. I think it's going to fundamentally change soon. Mm -hmm. I think we're about ready for a, a big, big change. And I'm really hoping it's not like TikTok. I'm, I'm hoping TikTok isn't like the vanguard of the future and everybody just does stupid little video clips. Yeah. So actually, <laughs> I did this experiment because um, everybody was telling me, get a TikTok. You, you know, it'll it'll support the podcast. You'll blah, blah, blah. And. I was like, oh, I have I have this experiment. Not only will I test AI, but I will use it with TikTok. So mm -hmm. I don't have to go into TikTok. I never do really. Yeah, yeah. Um, at all. And so 
there's an AI program out there that can that takes like my podcasts. You can upload like up to mm-hmm. two hours, which sucks because a lot of mine are longer. Yeah, the good ones anyway. And then <laughs> it it will somehow highlight like bite sized clips uh, in TikTok form and caption them. Yeah, and have it ready for you just to like just to upload like that. And it's it's insane to me. It and it's never the stuff I would pick. I'm like, this is not a highlight from this episode. <laughs> we talked we talked about way better things than this, yeah. but it's yeah. because maybe it was more clear and concise, or it thought like this was a full thought, you know what I mm-hmm. mean? Or I don't know how it picks that, but yeah, that's what I've been putting up on the Pragmagic TikTok. Uh so I did it with the Mitch Horowitz one. Mm-hmm. and it's yeah it just feel it's off it's like you it can feel wrong you can tell i had nothing to do with it but it's yeah. mine but it's mine you know what i mean it's my yeah, yeah. creation and so that's why i was like yeah i'll experiment with it and i think i did this about a month ago and i'm here to report like it, it, nothing's happening it's you know I, maybe yeah. it's because i'm not giving it that's the thing it's a beast you know you need to feed yeah. it and yeah like, i don't yeah yeah, I, I uh, we're two old men yelling at clouds right now. Oh, so 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 bad. Like I have I have I have hit my Abe Simpson phase. Yeah, I, yeah. I really have. Like I I can't I can't I can't do that stuff anymore. That's kind of part of the reason why I stopped doing stuff on Substack. I like this. Maybe social media is in its terrible twos. That makes sense. Oh yeah. I love be. this anthropomorphizing social media ai and the internet that we've been doing yeah it's, been... it's either it's either in it's terrible twos or it's yeah. a three nager that's a yeah. term i heard when my when my son turned three is that he's a three nager and i'm like no no fuck you he's just a kid yeah and it, did it turn out <laughs> three to be nager three i'm just not gonna call him a three nager he's three yeah that sounds creepy <laughs> yeah. let's see can you put those on other platforms yes um i have like put them i think i did one as a youtube short because it's all basically tiktok style now it's uh your stories youtube shorts they're all tiktok stuff now so oh it's all yeah you can you can just put them wherever but of course in my like you know feeble old man brain i'm like tiktok (laughs) for everything that looks like that you know yeah isn't that like a big part of threads too like the instagram shorts and stuff like that are just like basically like TikTok. There's got to be something going on. I just found it so interesting. There was like the big fight that was going to happen between Musk and Zuckerberg. But right before that, uh, Zuckerberg unleashes threads. That Mm -hmm. does extremely well. And then Musk like carpet bombs Twitter by changing it to X, which is (laughs) I kind of commend. It's just like it's one of those is it so dumb it's like brilliant kind of moves you know <laughs> like i don't just, know man. it makes absolutely no sense and you're like this guy just he either cares too much or doesn't give a shit and i can't figure it out but anyways uh but i just found that was funny that the news cycle was all revolved around that and then like mm-hmm. they were gonna fight uh and it was about like threads and twitter and yeah it just seemed like these this billionaire psyops of just keeping themselves relevant you know i don't know oh yeah yeah and i thought that was funny like they were really gonna fight in the first place i mean that that was just gonna be uh what is that called when they when you put somebody else's face on a body i don't know why i can't uh deep fake Uh, deep fake yeah yeah they were just gonna deep fake their faces on actual fighters bodies they were gonna actually make contact their weight (laughs) sizes like it it would it wouldn't even be an exhibition fight like that shouldn't be legal anywhere like yeah. Musk is like three times larger than you Zuckerberg. know Zuckerberg. You know? Well, and you know, according to all the rumors, Zuckerberg is training to be a MMA fighter, anyways. So I think smaller, yeah. smaller, big. I think he probably would have kicked Musk's ass. Yeah, that guy. That guy's a soft little rich boy. So. I guess it. Yeah, it doesn't matter uh, how big you are if you're on the ground when it yep. comes to grappling or whatever yep. I don't know. Yep. but yeah that's interesting i'm glad we did kind of break open this ai thing because i think we had enough time you know i can i can honestly say that i'm in a kind of passive resistance 
to it. Like I'm not offended by it in any way. And I think that yeah. it's it would happen it totally like that. Like, you know what I mean? I don't think there's some like nefarious aspect. I feel like there's something inevitable about it, but I also feel like humans would do that with it, you know? Like yeah. there's a, a, a part of the human experience too to feel, you know, godly or mm -hmm. to feel like, you know, there's you know, some part of creationism under you, I'm sure. Or, yeah. you know what I mean? It just, it all makes sense to me now. And I think with the copyright thing, I don't think, um, it's not I, do, I will it. say that with that means it's basically just a free art program for like YouTubers and thumbnails or yep. like, yeah, uh, website art, you know what I mean? But if yeah. you make something cool, someone can make money off of it by oh, putting yeah. it on shirts or, so yeah. yeah there's just a it's in a weird phase right yeah now. At, i mean at this point i don't view it as a threat as much as i just right. see it as like this weird philosophical like demon in a way where it's just like <laughs> i just it's a it's an interesting thing to talk about and think about and it's i mean yeah i kind of resent the fact that a lot of people view it as being the same as something that a person made that right that i find some resentment too because i have worked at being an artist for 30 plus years mm -hmm. and the idea of somebody grabbing a program and the next day they're an artist it's like i'm i'm sorry you're not the machine is right and absolutely yeah like like yeah. i find resentment in that yeah. but as far as like a threat like, unless I'm doing it to myself, I don't feel like it's a threat because I'm going to keep making stuff the same way I make stuff, mm -hmm. whether or not that exists. But now I have like it has inspired me to make some interesting stuff like like to to uh, like almost as a reactionary. To right. It. Yeah. Like like the autobiography thing, like it started mm -hmm. out directly as a this is a thing that is coming out of my just absolute hatred towards AI. And it turned into this entire trip through my childhood and mm -hmm. teenage years and i like started exploring like the people who influenced me in ways i hadn't even thought of and just the human human parts of what made me who i am instead of just looking at it through like the lens of art and the lens of ai removing the humanity of art is like i'm a human these are the things that make me human and maybe it's time i shared the parts that make me human instead of just like shielding it behind my art yeah i mean in a way it's analogous to like say as we were saying if chat gpt is really the memory machine of the internet since it went on to 2020 yeah. this is you authoring this the is, memory machine of you yeah, yeah yeah this is my memory machine up i i did the cutoff up to age 30 for myself because i i told i basically promised my wife that i would never do stuff about her or my kid uh -huh. and i never do yeah they i get mentioned they get mentioned but nothing yeah. more than that <laughs> i guess that's where i'm at yeah i've definitely mentioned stuff that's the other thing i'm definitely up against it's weird to write something that is um kind of memory and synapse driven um but also be present and working through said memories and synapses yeah with yeah. them and having to relay it um you know about things you're kind of still going through uh yeah. like with haunt manual that's why i was like I, I need to just do this like monthly because i can't this is not something i just sit and write in one setting or it's got to be it's something that's lived you know right like right, right every it's so like if when your cutoff is 30 mine is like the the other end where it's like it's it's live and that's the yeah. thing i find that we both share is we both had a hard time figuring out when it when it stops yeah 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 because like honestly between the ages of 30 and 40 that's when i got my shit together and things stopped being that interesting like i don't think i don't think anything that's happened in my life in the last 10 years people would find all that interesting because <laughs> like the last six years would be being a dad that is literally it and making art well, and also you've been you've been relatively active the last six years i like, have i have yeah you've been publishing we the hollowed like all of this stuff like people can find yeah, that it's but live don't know what has happened 
Yeah, yeah cuz like yeah. you look at like my Substack and you look at like mm -hmm. um no gods but my own everything in that was really current. Like that was basically as it was happening and I never talk about what happened before I was 30 other than in passing. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't talk about my brother, I don't talk about my parents, I don't talk about growing up in rural Minnesota. Here is no gods but my own, which was his amazing Substack. Uh, which yeah. you put on indefinite hiatus, right? It'll probably come back at some point in time, but I don't mm. know what it's going to be about anymore. I don't know. It's, it, the readership dropped like a rock <laughs> the moment I stopped talking about magic. Yeah. Like it dropped like a rock. And interesting. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I stopped, I stopped talking about magic and people stopped paying attention. And it's like, okay. That's so okay. funny to me because, like, what, a lot of your magic processes too was is making art <laughs> is making art but it was also like about the mundane yeah like and it's like i yeah after three books of writing about it in like the span of a year i think i'm good for a while yeah like if all i ever did was talk about magic at this point i'd be doing it for money essentially i'd be doing it because it gets me the attention and i know that magic is something that people pay more attention to and it's like if i wanted more clicks and i wanted more readers and i wanted all of that stuff i would go whole hog on magic yeah. because people people buy that they don't buy they don't buy weird weird fucking art experiments <laughs> yeah i mean that kind of makes sense looking back like you know i've always tried to have just as much helpings of artists that have no kind of direct relation mm -hmm. to the occult or magic as i did you know um ones that are into it but like the thoroughfare has always been art and that magic is art yeah. and you know these are the anarchic processes of which we you know parlay these ideas and stuff and it's it's yeah. through creative processes but looking back like i would i had somebody like john schmersel who in my head is like, you know, an intensely large figure in a musical community. You know, he was mm -hmm. a guitarist for Brainiac and he uh, fronted Enon, uh, big in the, like the Dayton, Ohio music scene with like the, the, uh, the breeders and, mm -hmm. you know, all of that stuff, like in my head, but like his community didn't really pay attention uh to our interview because of magic in the title and yeah. vice versa the my community didn't really listen you know to that interview so much because of no magic in the content you know yeah. and that was a realization it didn't deter me at all i was just like well you know i always wanted to talk to him i'm still going to do that it, it, yeah it's never going to be definable in that way yeah. But it is funny you bring that up because now when I rack my brain about why I haven't talked to uh, many modern occult authors is because I get that feeling. It's like it feels like they are just incessantly on a book tour. Like they, yeah. they come with pre-written bullet points and things yeah. to talk about and the scopes are limited and yeah. there's not a lot of humor either, which pisses me off like. Yeah. If you don't find magic funny, I'm sorry. You're doing it wrong. Like well, this shit's hilarious. Well, it's, how like even in its like most darkest moments, like it's fucked up and it's funny. Oh yeah. 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 And like if you can't come to it at like your own kind of context with it either, like yeah. my I could see a marked difference between like the damn machine era of uh mm -hmm. of no gods and the four color grimoire era. I got half as many readers because I was talking about comic books. Yeah, yeah. Half. See, and I, I love, I love that one. That's one of my favorites, personally. And I feel like that one was more about magic than Dan Machine was. It really was. Yeah, I could agree. I mean, maybe yeah. not on the surface, but for sure. Yeah, yeah more about like, mythology in general, or yeah. just like personal folklore, which is you know. Yeah. Magical. And it was it was like a deep dive exploration of a, like a pop culture mythology. And yeah, that felt way more interesting to me. But it could also be because I love comic books. And that's why I was writing about comic books. 
Well, but, I like, think that's too. There might be something. There might be a kernel in there when we were talking about, you know, aestheticism or like this weird trend of, you know, literal aesthetics. Because yeah. it's almost like listeners look for a certain thing instead of wanting to be introduced to something else. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. Like, if it has to be so brazenly literal. Like, if you yeah. didn't find the subtext of magic in my conversation with a musician who's been creating his own folklore his entire life, like, you didn't hear what we were talking about then. Just because yeah. we didn't talk about, you know, like, we didn't drop all the names or, you know, yeah. had all the SEO hits or whatever for yeah. your, your brain to pick up on. And I think that's the thing. It's like people are so reticent to... uh be multifaceted or nuanced about shit uh, yeah a lot it's, it's in the podcasting world anyways um yeah i'm not sure probably in the music world too yeah but like that. i mean people could talk all day like if people are willing to skirt like comic books like they'll talk about alan moore and grant morrison right. in magic but they will comic skirt books the are goofy. edge yeah. of, like everything that's not them goofy mm -hmm. it's just goofy and like there is more magic that in comics than just those two guys. Right. I love both of them, mm -hmm. but like Rachel Pollock wrote a yeah. a run on Doom Patrol that is absolutely amazing, and yeah. she's she was a well respected occultist even before she wrote that. That's a and, really good uh, point. Yeah, because I often think of like Peter Milligan too, Jamie Delano. Yeah, yeah they. Uh, yeah. They loved magic and they loved comic books and they, and they were but most importantly like they were fantastic fucking writers and exactly like you people that are reading like the invisibles just for the magic are missing they're missing so much the, yeah like just the kind of entire package and i see that a lot it's like let's yeah. have an invisible invisibles book club and just like pick apart all of the magical tethers yeah. and stuff and it's like god it's yeah it's just like killing the hyper sigil in a way because yeah. It's supposed to be this potpourri. It's supposed to be, you know, this. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think that's what it was really intended to be. Was no. picked apart in like a really scholarly way. It was meant to be experienced. Well, not only yeah, not only picked apart scholarly, but just to focus on yeah, that's, like you're looking for uh, the wrong pulling, thing. Yeah, pulling magical references though. Not even like the you know custom anarchic magic that's all through it. That he's yeah. Oh. Oh. people Thanks. miss that so yeah i'm not sure what oh did i cut out yeah i lost you there for a second oh, yeah, I lost you there for a second sorry hopefully i didn't <laughs> fully cut out but uh yeah i don't know i and you know to circle back to what i was saying before i think we we're both in a place that we're enjoying where yeah. we're able to yeah like fund and create and not feel uh interfered with and we're you know we're able to just make as much as we're able to make i guess i did yeah. drop out sorry about that um but yeah so it's a good stage i definitely see progression it's not i'm not at all like content right but yeah. i do often enjoy the ability to you know tour musically or you know um put out a book or you know keep up we the hollowed or you know work with you on sound art or put out a you know what i mean and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be in the uh like the guise of uh promotion cycles Damn. and that might hurt us yeah. but well, I know. Uh, it, it definitely hurt my <laughs> bottom line when it came to sales <laughs> <laughs> but at the same yeah I mean, of course, we would be we would be inauthentic, I think, to say that we we don't care if people buy our stuff. Like, of course, we want people to purchase our stuff. We, you know, yeah. there is yeah. there's immediate gratification in that someone is like helping, you know, kind of fund the plethora of stuff that we're doing, even in the smallest way. Of course, that feels good. But I think more importantly, I would just wish people would look and like listen and mm -hmm. share you know what i mean because yeah. when it comes to us having to do that you know for so many things like 
where it can be like echo chambered with a select few people and it doesn't really reach outside or you know and yeah that's where yeah yeah that's kind of always but, been kind of the like the thing that it makes me a little sad when it comes to my stuff is it kind of hits the same circle every time i'm i'm super appreciative I mean, of those yeah. people like i love those people i wish they would show other people <laughs> yeah yeah and i think that's a big realization i had too um it's not so much like making money or sales like it never has been about money i'm mm -hmm. i'm getting old enough now to where i'm understanding how necessary money is <laughs> like yeah and the woes of all of that but you know that's i'm a little late to the game on that one uh yeah. but before any of all or any of all that was always like i just want people to kind of like try it like just look just like give it a read give it a listen i mean i have close friends now i know don't read any of my shit or don't listen to new albums and stuff and i i there's almost like an economy and attention that yeah is more worthwhile than like the monetary stuff you know it's like even if you don't like it like just try it you yeah know? well like almost Maybe that aesthetic thing though i don't know yeah like everything almost everything that's in wombat is on we the hollowed for free yeah like everything even like the the rambling comics the like the um the fly comics all of that stuff is on we the hollowed for free like if people wanted to try out what i'm selling now they can find it they can find it it's the same with yeah. like no gods but my own no gods like it was all free it was all free you're right they're like even like the albums or you know the books or whatever these are basically just talismanic like totems of uh a, like the ability to appreciate something like yeah. by having a part of it right like it's not it's never like the intent to publish it to make sales to like you know uh survive or whatever even though of course everybody wants that but it really is always like here you know um for cheap you can have part of this am i yeah. echoing i i think i'm echoing i think i'm echoing no Oh, you're echoing to me. Let me try something. Sorry. I don't know what's happening. Still got an echo? Still got an echo? Oh, that's even louder. I don't have an echo. <laughs> oh, it is? Yeah, I can hear myself echoing. Check, check. Check. Oh, there it was again. Are you echoing? Uh, it's light, but I am echoing. I, I can't tell if that's on my side or not. Is it both of my mics working at the same time? I think it's actually me because I'm not using headphones. Here, give me one second. All right. Check, check. Check. All right. Is that better? Yeah, I heard nothing on that one okay cool yeah sorry about that i guess it just decided uh it wasn't gonna echo cancel uh, hopefully yeah. that wasn't doing it the entire it wasn't i didn't okay. catch it until like the last couple minutes so it's, i think we're good okay awesome yeah john side says you can hear you echoing too yeah that's on my end because it's a it's funny you know in my work with um like sound engineering and uh you know haunt manual and all this stuff and like the kind of psychoacoustics of everything that we're talking about and you know the feedback is literally a microphone hearing itself yeah and you know in our in our processes of like uh you know audio engineering that's that's the scariest thing you want to like you know cancel feedback it's like you don't want to overthink you don't want it to have time to think about itself you don't want to have time for it to think about its existence like don't <laughs> let it talk to itself you know well, yeah, often... feedback can go crazy yeah and that's like that's resonance like noise yeah but uh yeah I, I just always find that funny that uh you want to like the general rule is just to snuff out a microphone hearing itself <laughs> yeah <laughs> but there you go a microphone was hearing itself folks yep yep it was all part of the plan <laughs> uh, thematically it bonds it all together <laughs> yeah how are you on time 
I got plenty. I, okay, cool. Yeah, I got I'm going to plenty of time. Sweet. I'm gonna run to the bathroom real quick. Maybe have a, like a quick bathroom break, and then uh, we can continue on. I figured right. maybe I'll uh, play a song uh, while I do that. All it's right. a long one, so I'm gonna cut it off before we come back. All right. <laughs> Uh, I'll put you on screen though for Wombat. Let's see if this works. StreamYard is acting up today. So everybody, Wombat. Cool. There and is. I'm going to run to the bathroom real quick. I'll be right back. All right. Check, check. All right. Yeah. John uh, Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this is, um, it's rare that I have this long of a conversation and it's also like my morning morning. So. Yeah. Um, so you just finished your coffee basically. Yeah. <laughs> Pete, shake more than twice and you're playing with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that's yeah, the mm -hmm. AI thing. Um, but yeah, again, everybody, uh, please check out Wombat. Twenty bucks. Mine comes tomorrow. I checked the tracking. Was very annoyed it didn't come today for this, but uh, I'm very excited for it. Um, my partner Mary uh, is working with Eric too for mm -hmm. her album cover. Yep. And yep. Uh, uh, she has like we just have your book strewn across. <laughs> the entire place um and yeah she's she's stoked we had this idea of we're probably so we're we're attempting attempting we're going to uh do a mini tour kind of a lackadaisical tour from new mexico to 
Long Beach and then back up to Seattle uh, in October, the second week of October. I say lackadaisical because like some things have been falling through, some things been mutating. And uh, we have at least two shows that we're for sure doing, um, but we're not too worried about it. Anyways, uh, we were thinking about for merch, she was mentioning like making a stencil out of your mm-hmm. Moon Division uh, logo. The logo, the logo, and then yeah. Us just going to uh, Goodwill and finding fun stuff just to stencil. And see, that's a know. great idea. I love yeah. that idea. I love that idea. Because I'm really happy with how that stencil turned out, too. Like, mm-hmm. the, how that, that logo turned out. It was just, like, a weird, like, one-off idea I, I had when uh, my cover idea was a little noisier than she liked. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that's just part of the process, though, you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah, because, uh, you know, I, I just remember her, you know, showing with me, and she'd always be so pensive about it. And I was like, you know, if you don't, if you're not, you know, feeling something, just tell Eric. Like I've been working oh, with him for yeah. years. We're just like flat out with each other. Oh, I was thinking more like this, and she's like, "Oh, okay," you know, yeah. <laughs> like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." Like when I work with somebody, like I know that I'm doing it in service of their project, not mine. Yeah. Like I want them to be happy. If, right. If I'm gonna work I, with somebody, I want them happy. I don't want. I don't give a shit about my own ego. I'm like, I want it to look the way you want it to look. Yeah. Like, like when I did Anthony Tyler's last book, I did the cover of his last book and it was just like, I want to make a good piece of art, but I want it to be what you want it to be. So if I got to tweak it, I will tweak it. That is a really cool cover hunt manual uh, from Anthony Tyler. And I shamelessly uh, stole haunt manual. <laughs> you just from added, him. added an A. Well, <laughs> It's kind of fucked up the more I think about it. I may change it. I don't know. But I straight up told him because I initially thought he titled his book Haunt Manual. And I was like, yeah. fuck. That it's is a such good a title. good title. It's a good title. I think I was like, that's, it. I was like, that's such a good like title. Like, it's so good. It should have been mine. And I was like, like, kind of feeling like a little flustered underneath and realized it was Hunt Manual. Mm-hmm. He was. It, that, that was the title and i was like oh thank god <laughs> <laughs> but you're right it's one letter off it's, it's <laughs> probably not the best uh like the most he doesn't seem to mind uh, no nah, doesn't yeah. seem to mind also it's very different too but i guess it would be kind of in the same like circles yeah like sold so it's mm. something to think about yeah no, no. um here it is and here's your cover trying yeah. to blow it up but it keeps there doing it is it. oh Go. what the fuck yeah. <laughs> there we go the there it is yeah it's awesome yeah i think that's one of my better pieces it's so anthony too like yeah. it's kind of perfect you know for him as the writer mm-hmm. yeah I remember he got very confused about that red demon and what was going on with the bottom of its face <laughs> He's like, is that the nose? It's like, no, it just it doesn't have a mouth. It's just got a really pointy chin. <laughs> That's hilarious. I mean, it is coming out of something, so it's gonna be contorted. I don't know what I make most logic of it. <laughs> it's like what well, you have to see is coming out of the head of a you know a primal shaman, right? And yeah. uh, he's uh, <laughs> uncorking and unwinding. So I love that in- internal logic because yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, hunt manual. Yeah, yeah the more I see hunt manual, I'm like, gosh, probably, maybe like the collected book will be something else. I don't know. It's yeah, it's I'm too far in now, man. Too far in. <laughs> uh, but, so yeah, it, it, it is kind of uh, Anthony does have dive manual, so manual is yeah. very much like part it's of his his deal. Yeah, and but. manual is very misleading with haunt manual because it's more <laughs> like. This isn't a how to do it. This is how someone did it kind of a thing. So, so it's more like a hunt diagram. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Haunt, yeah, hauntography. Yeah. Uh, oh, man, I'm getting way too crazy with the cheese whiz when it's coming to like <laughs> haunting. Uh, yeah, haunting things. Um, <laughs> that and, uh, you know, just, um, yeah, just cheesy made up words and yeah. 
you know that lexicon but it's fun because i know with we the hollowed we have a, a lexicon too and a site that kind of collects some of the vernacular mm. and i'm going to do the same with this and you know and i think that's another thing that might get in the way a lot of this more eyes on things is mm -hmm. i think me and you we tend to like source ourselves more than anything else and when somebody reads something and they're like oh you mean that you know especially when yeah. it comes to you know the kind of mystical side of things i'm mm -hmm. always like no i mean this because i didn't know what that was you know <laughs> yeah yeah and exactly. uh and that that i can see that's why it's confusing like if i just did the grifter thing and used all of the appropriate words or yeah you know i don't that's know that's how you sell stuff that's how you yeah. sell stuff but, but yeah well was it philip blair that mentioned something about me doing dark comedy because it yes. made me think of this one from back in the day like it's, it's it's in the anthology it's in mm -hmm. the uh, the omnibus but it's a uh, it was a uh, what if uh, Cronenberg made the manual for an iPhone where it's just this thing that takes over somebody's life and goes a little like Star of the Conqueror on them and takes oh, over. I love it. It's so apropos. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the omnibus, that's a uh, hardback. It is. it is it is gorgeous you can get a soft cover or hard cover that's on the really shiny nice paper too that thing almost broke my computer though yeah i remember <laughs> like 400 thing, pages it nearly broke my computer yeah this thing's beautiful you can find it on with the hollowed yeah. uh, or here i'll copy the uh site here uh this is basically if uh you know if your new book of wombat that's that's yeah, basically that would be... a collection of recent stuff this is like all the good stuff from before right yeah that's from yeah. like that's almost everything from when i first started it's got i'd consider all my best stuff save for one book that i couldn't find the files for mm -hmm. which which made me really sad that i couldn't find the files for it it's so beautiful though it's like one of the forever like you know coffee table editions mm -hmm. for us um yeah because it's just it's so pretty can does lulu show you pictures of its actual what it looks like when it's printed no like on their site that's a bummer it should do that it should it should yeah uh, and that is the one book that i forgot to dig out today i actually <laughs> i have I could, I could run out of the room and grab it um but here yeah here's kind of a cover and yeah I thought I, I thought I did some excerpts on in that article but maybe i didn't Oh, no. you're not looking at it, huh? Um, so I was just sharing that. So yeah. Hey, there it is. There's your intro. Yep, my uh, forward. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's so good. Um, sorry, it's all the site's kind of weird with the it's layout. Very... But yeah, it's awesome. I love these. <laughs> um very reminiscent of that what's it the codex the codex oh okay codex seraph seraph yeah. yeah yeah that was the direct inspiration for it mm -hmm. honestly it was i saw that and it cost over a hundred dollars for the book and i was like i'm gonna make one for myself that somebody could buy for 10 bucks <laughs> yours is yeah yours is the perfect eric millar version of that book you yeah. know like because the the original codex is so mired in like the kind of uh renaissance or like mm -hmm. it's medieval actually right yeah yeah like medieval art style it looks of that time yours looks like yeah. yours of eric millard yeah doing it. yeah <laughs> let loose the skin of man and cloth within the divine i love it that guy rules <laughs> uh, yodorowsky yeah kind of yeah. <laughs> that's I, a good tattoo yeah man i don't oh, even remember uh, some of that stuff oh that's uh Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I have the one you rolled dice to. Yeah. So I have the one you rolled dice to. It's not near me. So I don't remember the title. I bought it years ago. I think, I think this was the impossible game. Or it's either impossible game. It could be bottomless bag or impossible game. It might be impossible game just because I remember uh, that one picked up 
traction and like the group yeah. that Donna side, I think, uh, you yeah, know, would be privy to. Yeah, and um, that's that's the one that now is through an actual publisher. That one's through Microcosm, like a legendary Portland publisher and legendary punk DIY publisher. Big deal. Yeah. Big yeah. big deal. Yeah, I don't want to talk garbage about them, so that's about mm. as far as I'm going to go with that one. Is it on? <laughs> So, yeah, what was your kind of takeaway? So you finally, so it's, it goes back to what we've been talking about, about self-publishing and what we've been doing uh, with We The Hollowed stuff. Like, what did you learn from finally getting a distributor or someone of repute, you know, to pick up your oh, work? And they, uh, I should say, maybe not what are the missives, but like, what what is the takeaway? Like, what you've learned that you're going to do moving forward? Well, <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to sugarcoat it. I... I think they published it two years ago. I think uh -huh. it's been two, maybe three at this point. I have not made a single paycheck off of that thing. Mm -hmm. And I know they've sold about 400 copies of it. That is absolutely so, insane to me. I. It's the most them. successful thing you've ever done. And yet. It is, I have not made a dime off of it. And I think yeah. they have a cutoff for royalties that I have been hovering around like two dollars away from oh oh and, and so when it hits that when then it hits i'll get two dollars then, then you get, get paid, paid for everything after that right yeah well no that's, that's when i get paid for all of the royalties they owe me currently oh cool okay i was afraid that it would be like okay it's like a deductible for insurance yeah. or something it's like you gotta spend this much and then after this we'll start taking care of stuff so yeah how they, much are the royalties for something like this like what's the I'm just trying to wrap my head around like a deal like this, you know, I make after their expenses, I get, I think 5% of the profit. Only 5%. Yes. I get 5%, which is why after selling 400 copies, I am not making $400. Right. <laughs> not even close. Um, if I had been selling that on my own as a print on demand book, which I was doing, <laughs> yeah. I would have made $3 a book. Did they choose to redesign the cover? They redesigned the entire thing. I was going to say, this doesn't feel like you because the original yeah. cover was better. Yeah. Oh, so much better. And I don't even know what the insides look like because they never sent me a copy. Yeah. And they did it and they're like, it's a zine. Yeah. It's a niche kind of you know zine uh style kind of printing yeah yeah i yeah. basically once i get my royalty check i am asking them to put it out of print and putting the print on demand book back out hell yeah do that because so. the impossible game print one that you did was awesome I'm just, it's I'm so gonna... nice it's oh so nice. i can't find it right i was gonna look at amazon but it, it's not gonna yeah it's there. out of print it's out of yeah. print the moment they published it i had to put it out of print so anybody that has that i love they... this made me think uh, the journal of a good artist who's also a naturalist and visits an alien world. I think that is exactly what it was supposed to be. So yeah. I will take that as the ultimate compliment. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, John said got the good one. Yeah, you uh, got the good one then. As did I. Yeah, those are collector's item now. I guess. <laughs> well, soon won't be. Uh, fuck. Maybe I'll just buy one from Microcosm and set you over the edge. Is that how it'll work? I don't know. I don't like, even know, man. Yeah. How many do you need to sell to make two dollars? Like, I, I just. I mean, yeah. I, I get basically. I, I mean, I don't, I don't like talking money. No, for sure. I and, and I don't like ask specifics. I just mean, but it's like, like it's not nearly enough for how many they're selling, yeah. or how many they sold, and it, it is very annoying to me. I know it's kind of it's sad, um, but you know uh, that's how they've done that's, things, and that's how they're still. That's how publishing know? works. That's yeah. how that's like the the big secret about publishing is you hear people talk about how they want to like get their book published, and what they don't understand is like maybe they get an advance, maybe they don't, but you're not going to make money off of your your work mm -hmm. until the publisher makes money off of your work. 
and there's also this air of like prestige right when it comes to publishing it was like oh it was good enough that a company is behind it that wants to distribute yeah. it but really all of that's bullshit too yeah <laughs> like, well and in this day and age like back in the day publishers like the main reason for publishers to exist is that they had pr arms mm -hmm. like they had press they could they could send it all around they could do all that stuff and people can do that work themselves now so like a publisher and at this point publishers have all been bought up by other corporations like it's just this big corporate circle jerk that yeah <laughs> basically gatekeeps people i i'm not sure about it looks like microcosm still operating kind of and it's they're the still their way. own thing yeah they're still there their own thing i used to live right by their headquarters uh and a fun they had a funky little house as their headquarters and mm -hmm. it's very much just um it really is just diy like punk ethos but like in a you know uh my it's like mired in just kind of the internet uh distribution culture like they, yeah. they really just kind of maximize that ethos out like because their headquarters is just full of books they'll probably never sell just yeah. like you know all the uh punk bands used to play with like it's just merch just littered their houses you know yeah because yeah. that's how they did things and you know they tour and they sell these things small press you know for bigger numbers smaller press yeah. that sort of thing so they yeah. and they really did it right and i did read um a couple of joe's books who's the head of microcosm and i think he had he had a great ethos and he was very much like that business-minded punk kid that you know yeah and i yeah. i got nothing against him i got nothing against him i mean i i as a creator who is used to self-publishing mm -hmm. i don't like how it works and i want i i used it as kind of an experiment to see if it was actually worth it to try going for a publisher yeah and it's i mean it's cool it's like uh in that sense i'm trying to give something analogous but you know it would be like if a label that i liked when i was a kid when labels were still relevant or whatever yeah like decided to put out a single you yeah. know what i mean and that was that but i wouldn't care about it now so much but it's it's yeah. a nice little like hey kind of my 13 year old self would high five me you yeah know exactly I mean? yeah. exactly and like <laughs> Like my parents, my parents, the, the moment I had a real publisher publish something of mine, I was a legitimate mm -hmm. bookmaker. The fact that I made like 20 books before that didn't quite put it over the <laughs> over the hill. But like a real publisher going, oh, yeah, we'll publish your book. Yeah, then I was like, I was legit then. There is. <laughs> yeah, there is just this association with self-publishing like it's, uh, you know, it's it's bad or it's yeah. not well thought out art or it's it hasn't been through a machine yet to refine it for the masses or yeah. you know some shit like that and it's just so funny to me because books like yours which are you know very art driven it's like in no place would an editor or you know a designer or someone come in to change it to make it more appetizing for general audiences because the idea is that it is what this is yeah and that's what it is like you don't need um you know a pr marketing firm or whatever to help yeah. figure out blurbs and shit you know it's like it, oh yeah it yeah is. yeah like my my original conception of why i wanted to make books in the first place is because i got burned out doing an art show that is mm -hmm. that is the origin of outlet press is i did an art show at float on in southeast portland i remember right next to my old place and yeah. I went a thousand dollars in the hole doing it. I didn't sell a single painting. I worked on it for eight months of just nonstop grinding on making art and mm -hmm. burned me out. Like I couldn't pick up a brush for ages after that. Like I basically stopped painting after I did that. Yeah. And I said, next time I'm just going to make a book. I'm just going to make some art and make a gallery show in a book hell yeah and that's what the first book was was a collection of that art show but then after that like hand of law hand of law was i did drawings inside of a law textbook and i just like that's my art show is the yeah. book itself i love it 
it, they're like, yeah, they're micro galleries in a way, or yeah. know, portable, portable galleries, right? Yeah, and portable that's basically, yeah, that's kind of how I envisioned like making books. And then, you know, like I, I came out of like originally, I came out of writing horror and stuff like that too. So it's like eventually I was gonna write a book, yeah, for sure. And like, uh, do you still have, have like King Toast? published or is that something no you took off? yeah i okay. took that off that one uh i don't even know what to think about that one anymore i've been thinking about republishing it because of everything's going on right now <laughs> yeah i remember it was really funny but i only bring that up just because your writing is varied too like you yeah. do horror you do really dark comedy funny oh, yeah uh yeah. absurdist you know well like, like yeah king toast the premise is it's yeah. it's it's you know, Donald Trump, if he had a toaster for it, <laughs> because he was full of hot air and he exuded orange. <laughs> I love it. And I love it. It's, it's, it's literature too. It's not yeah. a comic. Yeah. Yeah. It's literature. And oh yeah. <laughs> then he has an, he has an anus for a mouth. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Oh man. But yeah, there's uh you know, if anything, I just, yeah, I keep trying to think. I think I need to shield it. I think we grew up at, uh, at the death knell of the need of record labels and publishing mm -hmm. houses and, and stuff. And yeah. it is hard to shake. Like, because as is. a kid, you thought, you know, oh, all of the bands I like are on K Records or whatever, or on this label yeah. or, you know, Southern Lord or whatever it is. And like, you think that, you know, that's still the machinations of you know how things are done today and mm. i guess in some degrees there are but really just for like seasoned like veterans that yeah have invested or have some other sort of uh financial kind of outlet or you know what i mean or tour all the time or or their books yeah. are you know something like they have something else to kind of you know feed the money machine as it were and it's just interesting like our generation we there's like almost a trauma of watching the death of that but also like a revolutionary idea of like cool we got it like yeah. this is what we wanted the entire time is to say fuck you record labels or you know make our own record labels yeah well stuff. i mean it's it's yeah, yeah it's the twilight of the brand being the brand and the dawn mm -hmm. of a person being a brand yeah interesting like yeah personality yeah because yeah yeah publishers back in the day you like columbia records like you knew columbia would make a great record because it mm -hmm. came out of columbia records they had uh yeah curators that you trusted they, they were curators and now yeah. now everybody just does things on their own the person is the brand not the actual publisher like publishers and all of that stuff is kind of an afterthought i guess i i dig that in the same sense that you know you could put out music and i'd check it out because i dig eric millar the creator you know what i mean i think that's yeah. better instead of or like there are, there are parts some people don't like my music but they listen to the podcast or they like yeah. you know like my writing or they don't like anything at all which is mostly i'm just kidding but uh you know it's very like piecemeal now yeah. with that and i think that's better i think that's awesome because yeah. that's there's more freedom for us but maybe there isn't maybe that's actually really limiting because they're giving us a literal aesthetic to ourselves like our personality yeah you know and i, I mean, know. like i try to buck that as much as possible mm. like i don't i don't like the idea of being a brand and i don't like the idea of like just having like the eric millar aesthetic right yeah like, yeah, I mean, think I think that's like naturally why I always gravitated towards writing or uh, doing projects under like succinct heteronyms or like yeah. you know character names. Yeah, because it felt like that. It was like I, I, in my own brain, I need to separate what these things are, and that that helps me with the creative process. But also, it's like I can't be blamed for what Dakota Slim did, dude. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, don't yeah. blame me, man. You know, I don't know. Yeah. I, I well, think that's a cop yeah. out. But at the same time, I do find it limiting that. 
there there are people that can do it. I think Nick Cave is someone that I think of all the time. That's oh, like yeah, his books, his music, his films, like his yeah, acting. That's... They all kind of feel of a Nick Cave. Oh, very identity. much so. Very much so. Yeah. And his uh, what is the 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 Red Hand Diary or whatever it is, like his newsletter. Yeah, the like, newsletter. It's, it's Red, so right hand. Nick. Yeah, it's yeah. so Nick Cave. Mm -hmm. But like. Um, that's actually part of what I tried like with Wombat. Like this last year has been a year of like I I got burned out. I got so burned out doing doing no gods. Like I super burned myself out by trying to like keep myself confined to one thing. Yeah. And so like I like my reaction to getting burned out was like making sculptures. Yeah. Like I started sculpting Ramblin'. There we go. Which I love, like, yeah, um, another medium as a release from yeah, another like one. I just, I yeah. just like started making so cool, making yeah. clay little figures, and then I made a comic out of the clay figures. I love it, yeah, and That's it's like, awesome. So there, here I'll pull one up. But uh, your photography too, just like your cinematography of them, is something that's brilliant about it as well. Cause that I would love to get into something <laughs> like that. Yeah, I would. I wish I, I. I've always wanted to make a stop motion movie, but I. I think I'd end up like Phil Tippett with Mad God and just be working on it for thirty years and never yeah, be, never be done. It's like this perpetual project that is never finished. Yeah. So this is Ramblin' and Tooth, and it is. Uh, it's mixed media, but it's really like. Uh, photography it's, clay and literary yeah. yeah yeah and i like i made little sets like that is a little blackout set that i made mm -hmm. which i love yeah the spring and, too is genius under rambling yeah it makes it so it floats without actually being able to like you put them on a black background you couldn't see it yeah it's so good i love this like yeah the cast photo oh i might i mean dude you should do a music video with this <laughs> oh i wish i had the time i, I know. wish i had the time and the patience i know but how like, do how do we get that it's like i don't yeah it's like you can't trust anybody else to do it you know what i mean no, the way no. you would envision it but yeah. it'd be funny if even if it, the music video is just like a powerpoint presentation of just <laughs> your photos you know it's just it's made for that like yeah there's got to be something maybe there's and i think that's the other thing too uh you know, these ideas, I find this too all the time, like I'm very much in service to them, but I'm also enslaved because of time with the mm -hmm. ideas. If I have a great idea, I have to shelve it or I have to tend to it, see if it is something, but it just it limits more and more and more time and it, it takes away from things. And I often find that you know, the thing stuff with haunt manuals, like lost art and lost ideas and mm -hmm. synapses that, you know, I missed out on. Um, how do you structure things? You seem like you're a project focused at a time. Yeah, I yeah. try to be. I try to be. I for the most part, I try to have two projects going at the same time so that yeah. I don't burn out on either one of them. Mm -hmm. if I, I shift shift gears back and forth so I can like give myself a little bit of variety so I don't burn out. But yeah. uh, like ever since my son was born, I've had to really make my work. Like my, my workflow is way different than it used to be. Where oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Like I work in little bits here and there. Like whenever I get like a five minute point, like I just like write for five minutes or if an idea hits me, I put it down in my notepad app real quick. And then refine it later. And yeah, generally it's all in one project. But yeah, yeah, I so, try. And then I, just I'm cycling scattered. them. Yeah, scattered. Yeah. Okay. I'm so I'm so scattered now. I think I'm always just so obsessive about finding like a routinized way to juggle all of my stuff. But I'm with you. I I basically at any given time it's gonna be three projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like kind of combustible parts of them with like a release one kind of as like a extra like painting with my grandmother's paints or 
like something i just have no expectation of or it's not you know harbinging like you were saying like just something to break out of the the mold not care what comes out or free Mm -hmm. of judgment just to experiment you know but i think i'm yeah i'm finding with like the podcast in the mic in the macro is like that i'll go months without releasing something because i'm just like yeah i'd rather do this other stuff you know what i mean yeah and there's got to be a way to kind of like tend to it i think i've found it recently and it really is just giving very like being easy on myself about loose deadlines but knowing hey this month this needs to get done this needs to get done and this needs to get done yeah you know instead of like this looming when is it going to happen or it has to be out by this certain date it's like it comes out when it comes out but know that i am focused on it (laughs) yeah yeah and And yeah yeah i give myself pretty solid deadlines on most things and i probably shouldn't because i know a couple of things i've i've released in the past their quality was less because of the uh really solid deadline i gave myself but i give myself generous deadlines now i would say that's the same yeah generous deadlines with like a you know i don't speak about them until i'm certain but right like the deadlines are in my mind like the podcast will come out this week but i'm not going to say what day you know yeah. what i mean yeah or and like hot manual chapter will also probably be out this week but probably more like next week but i'm not gonna yeah. say what day but i know no. you know yeah yeah and like wombat originally like my deadline for wombat was the end of the year like i was i'm going to put this book out at the end of the year mm-hmm. and then the other project started to ramp up and i was like nope i'm putting this out now so i can actually put more energy towards something else that i will also put out at the end of the year I do like that you were just yeah you kind of like snuffed it out you're like i don't have any more time it is what it is i'm gonna be fine with it my interest is here yeah and it's great like it doesn't seem like it suffered at all from oh and like realistically if i would have added more to it it would have made it a lesser book yeah i think so yeah like like 200 pages is like it's a really good level like it holds it could hold people's attention for a long enough period of time and it's a solid body of work Mm mm-hmm where like if I had like been like oh my god oh my god I gotta get something else in here before December, I would have made shit. Yeah, <laughs> like I well, would have made I filler. I would have made filler. This is in line with what we've been talking about too, and just the process of the new book. You know, because I've said in that same way, um, I'm closing the uh, like hot manual experiences end in October but the chapters will continue to come out probably until the end of the year. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, I know the end of where I'm hitting. It hasn't been written yet, but I know where, like generally where I'm going. So there is like a loose kind of deadline and I want it to be done in 2023. I think that's important. Yeah. Um, but how is that because i know you've mentioned with the new book you're like how do you know when to end it like it just you know i don't i it's it's a weird thing i see the finality because i look back at the last chapters and i know that i'm itching to edit revise Mm -hmm. design and i know that there's two or three left like in my heart of hearts there's something intuitive about it where i'm like yeah there's maybe two three max chapters left and then i just need to like rip off the band-aid and be like start editing for print and doing all of that like how do you deal with that with this new book i mean that's that's a tough one because i don't even know like i don't know if it's done right yeah like, i feel like i i got my ending like i know how it's gonna end like it like I know how it's gonna end. I just exactly. don't know. I yeah. don't know how much more to put in the inside of it because I feel like the last couple of like things I remembered and put in there feel like those are like it's like a good solid core. Oh yeah. And the end fits really well because like it like this book is gonna have the same kind of cellular structure that disparate parts did, where the text mm-hmm. is gonna be small sections. There's gonna be a couple bigger ones in there. But it's going to be like a lot of like 500 to 700 to 1000 word sections yeah that i'm going to move around 
and that's the thing being discerning about like because if i don't say or if i don't have a loose deadline to cut myself off it will forever be worked on like yep it will yep. never end and that's why i came to you and was like i have a revelation about hot manual i'm gonna cheat and i'm gonna say it's volume one <laughs> you know? exactly that's yeah. perfect that's the perfect yeah. way of doing it though or no the cheat is to end it how i end it but then when i do it again that's when the volumes start you know what i mean yeah. so the first one can just be yeah. oh, man, and the second one comes volume out like volume two, two. <laughs> yeah it was always intentional right yeah. to do in volumes but i think yeah i'm with you on that i think like i i know it's weird for the like writing of the present or the yet to be like mm. happened to there's chapters that i've written that haven't come out yet that i'm itching because i'm so like experienced now not as much as you are with your stuff you know mm -hmm. like with years but like with me with like months or even weeks and this is like this hyper revelation chamber yeah. where i'm like i have to cut it off at some point because i would like to rest or focus elsewhere because it's just high intensity all the time you know? yeah yeah with the yeah. content and that's yeah. that's what my problem has been with mine too is like i guess like my cutoff was how much trauma do i think an audience can yeah. handle because <laughs> yeah like sadly the book is chock full of trauma yeah <laughs> and, i like how you put it how much the audience can handle you know yeah. it's not well, so I much mean, like, like how much you want to relive or or it's yeah like, yeah I, I keep good, I, I keep yeah. thinking i can relive it all the time because i already do <laughs> Start with all your three. I'll call it a new dope. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's like I can relive it because I already do. Right. Like I like those memories already kind of haunt me in a lot of ways. And the trauma left its mark. But like it's gonna leave a mark on other people when I share it. Yeah. I and mean, how much point. how much do I want to mark them up with it? <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, I mean, I guess in a weird way, I always feel there's like a just a general apathy when people read my stuff, like they read it like it's a character in something mm. or like they don't internalize it or like have Yeah. So that's interesting to think. I guess I've never thought about it like that. Like, oh shit, I hope I don't spark something and they start yeah. role playing, you know. Yeah. in their mind, but I guess that's what reading is. In a way. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's one of the things I know they did a study on it. And the more somebody reads the uh, like the more robust their empathy is. Right. Because reading is an act of embodying somebody else. Yeah. And I definitely feel that way. I just always. Yeah. I just maybe I need to give the general public a little more credit, you know, Yeah. or the general public like they care who I am, <laughs> you know, but yeah, it's just interesting to think about. I never. I never considered the audience like the audience, yeah. but not only just, I never considered the audience. Of course, that's not true. I mean, like I, I never considered how the, how much the audience could take, you know yeah. what I mean? Or like, yeah. is there like a power relate dynamic? Like, does it get abusive when I don't know? Yeah. It's like, it's you think that like, to me personally, it's been really, it's been, therapeutic mm -hmm. to to put a lot of the trauma i went through especially the stuff from when i was like a, a late teenager early 20s is to like look at that as a 42 year old and be like that that was really fucked up <laughs> that was a yeah. really really messed up time to live through but i can look at it 20 years later and i can i can see the entire shape of it now and you almost are looking at it as though i would think other people would look at it you yeah. know what I mean? Um, because you're so removed from it now, or like it's yeah. just it happened to somebody else, right? It happened basically, to basically a, a specter of self that I'm not that person anymore. So yeah, and yours is more it is what is happening right now. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and what like how I yeah, how it's being affected from the past or whatever, but also like the future and that kind of temp temporal element and you're right there's 
yours like i just feel like there's a wisdom to it mine is very like it's just a very ramshackle kind of this is how i don't get fucked up by my past <laughs> like, yeah exactly yeah. you're like you're like pre-working it <laughs> yeah yes yeah yeah exactly we had talked yeah. about this too about trauma about you know when i was doing interviews and people were like misunderstanding about what haunt manual was and like mm -hmm. uh you know like me trying to rewrite the past or something i don't yeah. think they were mistaking me but they were mistakenly comparing it to somebody who had similar ideas but their whole thing was to rewrite like the yeah. past and i think yeah. that's really really dangerous i like, do too I, I think examining the past is a good thing mm -hmm. rewriting it like it never happened or like how like it happened in the way that you idealize it right. that that's role play yeah that, that turns your past into role play it, it's, I want to commune with it. Like, I want to get to know yeah. it. I want to name the demon and buy it coffee sort of thing. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, I the this whole... It's weird. It's a weird conundrum because as much as I am... All, like, my motto is customize everything. Like, yeah. I, I don't want to customize the past. That's, like, maybe a limit that I have about that. Like... Yeah. I mean, I do in some degrees because, you know, well, it's I fun. Well, I mean... <laughs> Here's the thing about customizing no. the past is you mm -hmm. are the the past customized. I'm, yeah, I'm the you yeah, are that the generator. Yeah, the the, the past customized into you. Mm -hmm. Like, because you react to trauma, so you change how you act. Yeah, and like with a microphone hearing itself from the past. Yeah, yeah, like actively engaging with the trauma is a new way of dealing with the trauma. It's a different way. It's not like. Right, it's I mean, not rewriting it. It's yeah, not rewriting it's, it. It's yeah, just dancing with it. It's dancing with it and like you know, just seeing it for what it is. But yeah, that was a scary you know, I don't know, that was a scary thought experiment about how many people like really relished in that idea of kind of magical means to rewrite the past or yeah it seemed like this like almost like mass hypnosis or like a mass yeah, yeah. remembering kind of tool i, I of yeah. course i don't know it very well and i could be i'm just going with automatic thoughts that i had yeah I yeah well and like i'm going yeah like i know we're thinking of the same person and the same mm -hmm. ideas and like i was going off of like interviews and things i was hearing and it just didn't mm -hmm. feel right something it didn't pass the smell test for me like yeah. in, a, in a lot of ways it had like it, it feels like it kind of had the same dna as the secret where it's like oh, I see. Okay. it's like you take new thought and you just take it and you you, you try to boil it down into this thing that everybody can do and it's good for right. you, you just do like it to your memory always good but you're doing it to your memories it's a way of yeah. it's a way of engaging with your past in a way to recontextualize it but it's like you can't you can't change the past it's there yeah. It's it like a happened. It is like a self hypnosis NLP past, you know, uh, transmission or something. It's it's interesting, yeah. but yeah, yeah, and it's just like you know, with the book that you're writing now, it's you know, I think that's why I brought it up is because we both share that. that yeah, you're not doing it to do that. Like it's no, not, no, it's it's you're very blunt. much living into it, and it's yeah. it's very blunt. And there are there are a couple of things I haven't like really talked about publicly before, and like I hesitate to like they're the things that are on the fence right now because they are pretty dark and they might you know affect people that I don't want to affect. But like these are things that a person has to deal with. Like you can't run away from it. You can't rewrite it. You can't make it go away. It's a yeah. thing. It's a part of you. And like the act of writing this book had very real world consequences when I like I was visiting my family like a month, month and a half ago. Right. Yeah. Because I was working on it and a lot of stuff got stirred up and it led to an actual conflict with members of my family. Mm -hmm. Like it led to a conflict that had been boiling for 20 years. And I just I had never dealt with it. I had never really like thought, OK, I need to like deal getting... with this. You're fine. You're having like actual symptoms from the poison. Finally, 
yeah like, and so i so i was like dating yeah yeah this conflict has been needing to happen for 20 years mm -hmm. and i've been avoiding it and now living through like what i lived through and going no i'm not going to just be okay with it yeah like, i need this cut out like this is this is a wound that i've had for 20 years and it is time to get rid of the scar tissue and let new skin get rid of the wound let new skin grow yeah and that no the only i love way, that the only, the only way, way you can through. do this conflict yeah. the only yeah. way to do it is with some sort of conflict you can't rewrite it you can't reimagine it you can't cover it up because it's still going to be there so you have to engage with it do you have a working title for this book you want to share um it has been cycling through a lot of things i'm actually not I, I have to look and see what I have it at right now. Nice. Because it was originally the lines draw a memory machine. And then uh -huh. I, I was like, that's too mechanical. And it's that's now... a big uh, theme, though, with it is. Your it is. Yeah, it is. And I changed it to like right now I'm leaning towards lines grow the memory garden. Lions or lines? Lines as in draw lines. Yeah, I love it. Lines draw the memory gardens. That's like that's a that's a very like whimsical title. I like it. It is. It is for a, for a very much not whimsical book. Well, <laughs> I'm sure that if folks go and sign up to wethehollow.org, you'll see on the side it's got an email list. Anything and everything um, Eric does is definitely oops sorry promoted on <laughs> We the Hollowed. Yeah. And um, it's basically, it was, you know, it was a collective. It's turned into just a, a funnel for Eric and I's disparate works, <laughs> both together, separate. But right here, give us a fake name. Give us an email. Uh, you'll be uh, updated anytime there's a post on the website. That's also, you'll be notified for like Prag Magic and uh, all that good stuff. Um Eric, have you ever thought about a Patreon or something? Nah, like I, I have this weird thing about Patreon where I like the way I look at it. If somebody wants to financially help me, they should just buy the book. I, that's fair enough. Yeah, I like, um, I've been really enjoying it because it has been for something that I do that's like uh, there's a lot of combustible parts, like say the podcast or the streams or. You know what I mean? Like things that can exist and go away. Like it's been nice to, you know, uh, share those things plus things of different edits and drafts and, you know, mm -hmm. work music and basically just a funnel for all of the artistic stuff that I do. Um, and yeah, I've been enjoying it a lot. It's basically the only social media that I, I use kind of the most because I do feel in service to it. Like if I'm yeah. going to post something, it's going on Patreon first. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that is uh, patreon.com slash pragmagic. <laughs> and for a buck, you can get all the goof juice. Um, like I said, I really have been having tons of fun with it. I have, what is it over now? I've got over, it's like some insane amount of posts <laughs> that I have on there, which is crazy. But uh, yeah. Um, for a buck, you get all the, like, people have heard the Ren Collier uh, full unedited interview, you know, um, when I did it. They could have even seen the stream, which is in public and is going to be the next podcast. You know, stuff like that. It's kind of become the funnel of the disparate parts, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just something to think about. I think, like, um, something that's just kind of a little uh, tip in the hat you know mm -hmm. to uh your continuous work or you know chet czar um who became um a patron he has one and he posts all the time about um you know works in progress like his art yeah. and stuff and i was like oh man eric would probably kill it here oh you know? i don't i don't know i don't know i feel like i i already feel like i engage too much <laughs> oh yeah well that's why like it gives me an excuse to not be so bountiful on social media because i'm like yeah. i have incentive for with uh, uh yeah. the patreon oh uh, yeah sorry uh i think i 
There we go. It's HTTPS. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and yes, John, oops, Jonicide is already <laughs> a patron. I love it. Again, for the first time. Appreciate it. Um, and I say all this because Eric and I, you know, we, we do a ton together. Um, he is the illustrator for Haunt Manual. So if you're a fan of Haunt Manual or a fan, like, it's not really a fan thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you if you subscribe to Haunt Manual, then it is all of Eric's art. He's basically the de facto artist for pretty much all of anything literary that I do or, you know, um, for Pragmagic, for mm -hmm. We the Hollowed. So this is basically all of his art. <laughs> yeah, I even did that weird manipulated photo. <laughs> of my, Yeah, of me uh, when I was... I did that one un unprovoked. I love if you it. sent me the photo, I was like, I'm just gonna fuck with that photo. Yeah, it's very unsettling. <laughs> Even it's for me, especially. Like <laughs> it's kind of like some Lovecraftian like look into the abyss, you know. But yeah, so uh and then yeah, subscribe to Haunt Manual, which is also a thing. Of course, everything gets funneled through We the Hollow though, eventually, if not immediately. But uh for Eric, I think all of your links are out. Is it still Outlet Press link tree? Yeah, yeah. I uh, I ended up getting. I have too many followers as Outlet Press that I can't really discard the Outlet Press like moniker. Yeah, I know how you feel. Yeah. Like so, there you go. I'm gonna put this. Um. Yeah. Follow him on all the socials. Again, I think. Uh, we're pretty good about anytime you post something like a work that's out or that you're doing, it's usually through like We the Hollowed. So, yeah. I was cross post between No yeah. Gods and We the Hollowed these days. So there you go. I love it. There's basically all of his most recent uh, works in print, which is, that's really <laughs> nice. <laughs> my link tree i've got to redo have you seen these universe sites you showed me and i i couldn't quite figure out how to like do it properly for me yeah i'm trying to think if i messed with it i couldn't figure out how to edit it either uh we, i brought it up the other day and was trying to edit it and have fun with it and i think you have to have an iphone or an app to do it or something yeah. or i did it on you can't do it on your phone or something yeah. So yeah, it's like pragmagic mm -hmm. .univer se, and yeah, it's basically like a link tree. I just really like it. Looks slicker, you know. Yeah. So, uh, there was that's, a. Uh, that was the a, famous. Uh, sorry, that's the famous. That, uh, that is the uh, image. Gavin's rituals drawing Eric did for Revel Ross. So. There yeah. It is. Yeah. I, I I got that one done in like two hours. <laughs> And it's now become like an iconic I post everywhere. <laughs> it's like fucking uh, profile pic for everything now. But yeah. Um, so yes, please check out. Is it not switching? All right. Yeah, check out his new book. Um, it's I'm really excited. I'm definitely going to, you know, uh, shout it out when I get my grubby hands on it tomorrow. Let's when it see. comes in the mail. Yeah. So it's, it's Wombat, but... It's the same book, not the same name. Yeah. <laughs> I like yeah, I'll let you. Oh, I already did that. Let me see here. Because it's got like the redone operator's code. Yeah, I love it. That one especially. Um, the uh, buried. No, nope. the, the flies. Yeah. That was such a cool little thing, though, too. I love the. I and I held that I held that idea for so long. <laughs> you can tell I'm out of practice because John's like, wait, there's a new book. It's like, shut up about <laughs> it already. <laughs> yeah, it's got just want to make sure uh, everybody knows there's a new book. New book. <laughs> yeah, new book. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. Uh, thank you. I will definitely check in with you later. Um, oh yeah. I've got to get cracking on finishing this podcast work on the haunt manual thing. And then I've got like a 70 hour work week starting tomorrow. So I'm trying to get Oof. as much done as I can with this small free time and yeah. hopefully coast off of that for a week. 
<laughs> yeah. I just have a six year old to chase after in like a couple hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And thank you everybody for showing up and watching again, you know, just, uh, I think we live in an economy of attention. And so you giving us a little of your time means a lot and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, share, do all the stuff. If anything grabs you, uh, make sure to yeah. let other folks know. Yeah. Any last words? Not that I can think of. Good. <laughs> buy the book. Buy, buy book. All right. <laughs> Anyways, uh, big love, everyone, Bye. and uh, haunt on. When we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable. That every human soul is in fact one human soul. It is the soul of the universe itself. And as long as you are doing the will of the universe, then it is impossible to do anything wrong. Mm -hmm.